Lately, we've been doing some interviews with economists about the role of carbon pricing versus industrial policy. And we interviewed Danny Cullenward from Stanford uh, recently about a book he wrote on making climate policy and Rebecca Dell in early January about green industrial policy in the US. And today we're gonna to be talking to Brendan Haley from the Broadband Institute, who has written a blog post on five reasons why Canada needs more industrial policy in addition to carbon pricing. So welcome to the interview, Brendan. Pleasure to be here. Now look, you have five reasons why we need this uh, stronger industrial policy, which by me, we're talking about regulations and when we're talking about subsidies, uh, public subsidies and public investments and innovation, those sorts of things. And so you let's start with the first one, which is uh, political support depends upon economic security. And I could you explain that, please? Yeah, well, I think um, there's a real danger that carbon pricing becomes a political lightning rod for um, people's legitimate uh, anger over inequality and economic insecurity. Um, and so, you know, it's the role of industrial policy to create good jobs where we need them um, and also to create uh, low carbon services, right? The ultimate distributional implications of a carbon price don't just depend on this rebate policy, but also depend on people's ability to access services like energy efficiency or public transit um, that'll help them, you know, reduce, reduce those costs. So I think there's a really urgent need that the higher the carbon price, the more urgent the need is to have those more specific policies in place. Now, Mark Jacquard, an economist at uh, Simon Fraser University has made this argument uh, before that while carbon pricing in theory may be the least cost way to reduce emissions, that there's lots of other policies that are not that much more costly, but they come at a much less, uh, much lower political cost. And really, you know, if, if it comes to down to, you pay a little bit more for something that will actually work and, and not uh, meet a lot of political opposition like the carbon tax did, it's actually worth the trade off. Yeah, I would say that the, the most successful policies are those policies that build political coalitions that support them. And carbon pricing is particularly bad at that because it's sort of a broad benefits across the economy, whereas those who really are high emitters have an interest in mobilizing against that policy. Whereas industrial policy is actually more targeted towards specific sectors like energy efficiency, like geothermal, like, you know, public transit. And it's uh, through those more targeted policies, you also develop those political coalitions who have an interest in those particular sectors. So again, there's a more urgent need to develop stronger political coalitions that are gonna support those specific industrial policies and will also then support the carbon price. Let's talk about your uh, second reason why we need more industrial policy and that is we need more information. Yeah, so carbon pricing I think is particularly useful, not because I have a view of the economy that you can just send price signals and then there's this magical optimization that happens. Um, rather, I see price, price signals as important information to the economy um, signal through prices. But prices is really a very one dimensional signal. It gives you uh, a signal about, you know, don't buy or produce things with high emissions, but it provides very little guidance about the best way to do this. And industrial policy, the leading thinking of it is that it's actually a discovery process where we can pass much more complex information about net zero solutions that are out there. And that information exists through people sharing, you know, technological information, cultural information through networks, not through markets that are using pricing signals. So great added information, but industrial policy backs that up with even more, you know, qualitative non-price information. Well, it seems then that your third point is directly related to your second. And the third one is carbon price, the carbon policy, sorry, carbon pricing pushes, but industrial policy steers. Yeah, exactly. I mean, you know, just sending out a carbon price, um, you know, pushes all areas of the economy to reduce emissions, but it provides very little guidance of the most promising social and technological futures. And there is still a danger that, you know, you could have something past a cost benefit test with this carbon price that locks us into a particular trajectory that ends up being 
a dead end. So we still need to have a more qualitative discussion about the risks and benefits of certain types of technological futures versus versus others. Um, and that's where you know industrial policy concerns itself with that direction of economic change, that potential to you know facilitate um, you know technologies that we've seen like wind and solar that have been taken off and dramatically reduced their prices. How can we get other types of um, positive feedbacks or takeoffs like that happening and avoid you know dead end technologies? On a related point, uh, I've argued in a number of columns that the uh, research currently going on in Alberta Innovates uh, about turning uh, oil sands bitumen into the precursor that makes cheap carbon fiber, uh, that would never take place if it was just left up to market signals. The government money has been in, invested in uh, in the research in the lab and in the uh, you know the pre-commercialization work, the R and D work wouldn't happen if, if it was left up to the market and to carbon pricing, yet there's a tremendous value in moving the hydrocarbon industry from a combustion present to a post-combustion future, and you have to target it like that. You have to, there's an opportunity, but you need to make it deliberate and targeted. Yeah, I think, again, industrial policy, um, the tools it works with is capabilities. It tries to identify particular capabilities that exist in sectors and regions, and how could those capabilities evolve? And, and so thinking, um, as you just did, about you know, our existing economic structures, what capabilities can then transfer over to a low carbon economy? And those capabilities are gonna be different from region and per sector. And, and uh, that is really needed um, to think about Canada's role in a net zero economy, but also again to develop those political coalitions and those narratives of you know where we are in a future, where Alberta is in a net zero future. Because the more that we can clarify that, um, the less uh, political opposition you're going to get to something like a carbon price, um, because it you know it doesn't provide that that clear signal to you know, where the jobs might be, where the next role, the next pathways of technological innovation are gonna be taking place. Right, and your fourth point is that industrial policy has to be targeted. So we've just talked about that, but I, I'd like to point out, and uh, Dr. Sarah Hastings-Simon at the University of Calgary has done some interesting work in this, is, is that the Americans, as an example, talk free enterprise and talk marketplace, and in the meanwhile, spend tremendous amounts of money on industrial policy and research and development and science so that they can target particular sectors of their economy and where they're going into you know, uh, that, that next phase of economic development, the, how do you get into the low carbon future? And it seems to me that that kind of example uh, shows what can is possible under the kind of industrial policy that you're advocating. Yeah, I mean, and they're and they're very activist in it. If you look at ARPA E, I mean, they are not just looking at basic research and development. They do project management, very active project management in coalition with the private sector, innovators, and government all the way along from basic R and D to how are we going to market and deploy these types of of new technologies. And you know, and they've they've had missions like the Sunshot Initiative, which tried to dramatically reduce the cost of of solar uh, solar electricity. So in Canada, we need to find our missions. I mean, are our missions, um, you know, how to use that legacy of oil and gas to move to a low carbon economy, to you know, retrofit every building um, in the country, to strategically use our hydroelectric power. You know, those are the types of um, missions and pathways that we have to start defining for ourselves. And, and as I said, there's a there's an even more urgent need to do that. Um, if there's a carbon price uh, in place. It sends the right signals, but it actually sends the signal for the rest of the policy framework and that policy system to get moving very quickly. Right, and of course that was your fifth point is that industrial policy defines the country's role, Canada's role in a net, in net zero economy. And I've, I've made the argument in columns that you need to have those kinds of discussions uh, before you head into policy initiatives and so if we use the example again of the oil sands, we said, okay, we're gonna move the oil sand from making feedstock for fuels that are burnt 
to feedstock for materials, some of which will then go into, you know, sort of clean energy technologies like electric vehicles. Once we agree on that, that that's our strategy, that's going to define Canada's uh, role or uh, reposition our, uh, the oil sands going forward, then we can talk about the industrial policy and how carbon prices will play a role in that process, all of that. So this idea of, of positioning Canada's role in, low, uh, in the net zero economy, I think is absolutely critical. It plays into the larger narrative, the way we talk and think about energy. Yeah, and that, that's another signaling device, right? You can send a signal through prices, but you can also send a signal by saying, you know, this is where we all want to get to. Can we all see a future here, right? And, and wanting to reach that, that broad goal is, is really a democratic exercise. And, and, it's, and it's something that deserves to not just be saying, well, let's let markets figure it out, but, but deserves to be a, a democratic deliberation because there might be other concerns we have such as you know, indigenous reconciliation or other types of environmental impacts um, that might make us choose one direction you know, or, or another. Um, and I should say that there's this caricature of an industrial policy, which is, you know, rigid directions set by the state. And that's really not, you know, the way we've been thinking about it for the last number of decades. It's a, it's a discovery process, right? Which means we set directions, we, we experiment about what works, what doesn't work, and we're very open to cutting off things that don't work, you know, once we learn they don't work. It's that type of you know, iterative and learning process that that we have to that we have to go through. Well, this will be the final point, uh, Brendan, but I'd be interested to get your uh, take on it. My observation is that the Trudeau government, since it was elected in 2015, has actually done a pretty good job of that. There's been a lot of consultation, stakeholder meetings, and you know, getting people on board this kind of you know the, around the climate policy and the and some of the energy policies. And it doesn't get a lot of recognition. It doesn't get uh, talked about much, but it really seems to be a part of that, you know, uh, making that process really robust, what you just talked about. It's iterative, it's, it's uh, um, anyway, you, you know where I'm going with this. Uh, I think that it's been a good solid process that reflects what you said. What's your take? Yeah, I mean, it's interesting that this this uh, climate plan that was released in December had this $170 carbon price, which gained a lot of attention, but the environment minister actually also described it as an industrial policy. And it, you know, the leading uh, chapters were about energy efficiency and transportation were not about, you know, economy wide carbon pricing. So I do think the government is, is, is thinking um, along these lines, but I think the danger is that we still fall into an idea of, oh, well, the carbon pricing will, will, will take care of it. And there's not a need for, you know, very large scale public investments. And there's not a need for really developing the, the institutional capabilities in our public sector to implement this, this type of policy. Because I think those are two areas where we need work to be done. So, um, you know, I, I hope that, for instance, in the next budget, we don't see them saying, oh, well, we already did all the climate change stuff. In fact, if you want a carbon price that actually reaches that level in 2030, there's an even more urgent need for large scale public investments of things like low income energy efficiency to provide that security for good jobs in the low carbon economy, right? For, for new political institutions that can implement this type of, of policy going forward. Brandon, thank you very much for this. Really appreciate it. Thanks, it's been a pleasure.